Today on Venusidon, an introduction into how air and water cooled argon ion lasers work. Let's start with my American Laser Corporation 60X argon ion laser that a friend gave me a while back which was originally part of a Xerox 9700 laser printer. I'll be taking it apart and removing the toner inside. First I removed the light sensor from the front of the laser. This helps keep the laser stable during operation. The laser aperture has a reflector mounted at 45 degrees, which reflects a small portion of light onto the sensor. Argon ion lasers have optical components on each end of the laser tube, the high reflector and output coupler. The output coupler is where the beam emits from, though it reflects most of the light back into the laser to maintain stimulated emission. The high reflector is on the back of the laser and reflects all the light that hits it. These two optics reflect light back and forth. Both of these optics were removed before cleaning. They also needed to be taken off before the laser tube could be taken out and cleaned. This is the laser tube itself. On each end it has a specially angled piece of glass called a Brewster window. These are found in most gas lasers as well. Their function is to polarize the light as it travels between the high reflector and output coupler. The laser tube also has four heat sinks to keep it cool during operation which require a lot of air to be passed through them. With the laser tube and optics removed, we can see just how much toner there is inside of the laser head's frame and on the electronics. Toner is not an easy thing to remove, especially when it's been baked on from all the heat generated by the laser tube during years of operation. The hardest things to clean on this laser head will be the wires, small electronic components, and the layers of buildup on the bottom of the laser's frame. The laser head has three circuit boards inside. The smallest one connects to the light sensor, another board with high voltage capacitors and transformer for igniting the laser, and finally the laser power supply input and interface mounted on the side panel. At this point, many of the boards, wires, and electronic parts are a lot cleaner than they were before. This was accomplished by using isopropyl alcohol and acetone. However, lots of cleaning still needs to be done. After a few rounds of cleaning on the bottom of the laser head's frame, using isopropyl alcohol, acetone, and ether as well, this was how it looked, which was a huge improvement. There was still a lot of toner on the bottom at this point, so it was time to let the case sit and see if some of the toner would loosen up more. In the meantime, I started cleaning the laser tube. Cleaning the laser tube itself is a delicate procedure. This is because of the glass ends and the Brewster windows, which are held in place by air pressure alone due to the laser tube's low pressure argon inside. This is a task of great care and even greater solvents. For this, we use trichloroethylene, which was used to remove the toner with minimal physical force. A soft, bristled brush was also used to remove toner that was on the tube's mounting bracket, metal housing, and heat sinks. Afterwards, another solvent wash was done to remove the last little bit of what remained. Trichloroethylene was highly effective at removing the toner on the laser tube, and it also took off the toner on the laser's frame. After a final cleaning of the frame and electronics, everything looked fantastic. I was quite happy with the end results as it was much better than expected. Here's the laser tube after cleaning, and it looks beautiful. This certainly was quite the effort, but the results were well worth it. Now it's time to get it all back together and see if the laser works correctly. These two parts that look like small air tanks are actually filled with a desiccant. They attach onto the high reflector and output coupler with hoses and keep the optics free from moisture. They're being restored in a vacuum oven while the laser is assembled and tested. Putting the laser back together is relatively easy. The most important thing is to ensure that everything is lined up and centered correctly so that the high reflector and output coupler slide onto the ends of the laser tube properly. Once the optics have been placed back onto the laser's frame, it can be tested to see if the tube ignites, and if so, the optics can then be aligned using the three large nuts on each side of the laser's frame. Let's go over how an argon ion laser works so you understand what's happening a bit better. 
An argon ion laser works a little like a vacuum tube. There is a heated cathode that produces electrons to make a conductive path for electricity to flow in the argon. This energy excites the argon atoms, causing photon emission from the argon in the ion channel. The light is then reflected between the high reflector and output coupler, as well as through the Brewster windows, which all make stimulated emission possible. The argon is also circulated in the bore from cathode to anode due to cataphoresis. To keep the pressure constant in the laser tube, gas return paths are in the ceramic core that allow the argon to travel back to the cathode side. To test the argon ion laser, two sources of power are used. The first one is for the heated cathode, which takes 2.8 volts at around 20 amps. To run the cathode, a 25 amp adjustable power supply was used. The second source of power is for the laser tube, which requires 96 volts at around 8 amps. To drive the laser tube, a 10 amp capable ferry act was connected to a 40 amp full bridge rectifier and a large 400 volt capacitor to smooth out the DC from the rectifier. The voltage for the laser tube was brought up slowly to prevent excessive current draw from the capacitor overloading the full bridge rectifier. There are also three heater elements in series with the laser tube to shunt some of the current during ignition and operation. The power going to both the cathode and the laser tube is monitored as well to avoid possible damage. When the proper voltage is reached, an attempt at igniting the tube can be made. For this, a high voltage Odin coil was used. However, the laser did not want to ignite. After all the effort on cleaning the laser, I felt like Odysseus. Hearing, without gas, ions are nothing. We also tested the setup on this larger pulsed argon ion laser, and it did not ignite either, though the tube may require higher voltage. This also means my laser might not be bad, and may still work on a full power supply. More on that in a future video. The next laser is a 6 watt water cooled argon ion, which is a Lexel 95. There are some new parts in this diagram, an electromagnet, water jacket, gas reservoir, and tuning prism. Here my fellow laserist Adam explains all the parts and how they work. Please put on your safety goggles and enjoy with your remaining eye. Ion lasers are an interesting beast. The first thing they require is power, and lots of it. Up through this cable we have three phase 240 volts running through it at around 30 amps. Up here we also have water, water coming in and water coming out. All this collimates over here to the power supply unit, as you can see here with the cover off. Um, the power supply and the laser are both water cooled. Inside here you can see the pass bank. This is what limits and controls the current going into the laser tube. As you can see here, a large umbilical cable is coming out of the power supply and heading off to the laser. Walk over here, we can take a little closer look at the power supply. You can see all the uh, individual large transistors that are in there, and these are all water-cooled on this plate over here. Here we have a transformer for line voltage correction, so if the voltage is a little off, uh, depending on the laser's needs, you can uh, adjust the taps for doing so. Over here is the front panel of the power supply. Lots of various interlocks to make sure that everything's in check before the laser actually fires. And uh, basically you have some basic controls here. Current control for controlling the current that goes in the tube. And you can switch to light control, which is actually an optical feedback which makes sure that the laser is not wandering all over the place if you want a particular amount of power output. Over here, we can see the umbilical cord that comes up from the floor and then goes to the laser head. So right here is the laser head. If we come take a closer look at the whole entire arrangement, over here under these jackets are the Brewster windows that go across the bore of the laser tube. The bore of the tube is a ceramic tube, uh, and then this black piece you see here, the smaller tube, is the water jacket that goes over the entire bore of the laser itself. Um, the water feeds into there and then goes uh, and streams across the tube. 
There's also a magnet in this, in this housing that basically focuses the plasma discharge in the tube to make sure it's not rubbing against the bore and burning it up. This larger black jacket right here, there's a metal tank in here, which is basically a reservoir for additional argon uh, that the laser will need during its life. And uh, that's housed inside there. As you can see over here, this right here is the uh, uh, ignition transformer for lighting the discharge in the laser. Once the laser is lit, um, because it's an ion laser, it draws a massive amount of current and is almost a dead short to the power supply, uh, which is the reason it creates so much heat and so much discharge. Um, this right here is the output coupler mirror uh, where the laser emits from. And then back over here is the high reflector of the laser as well. Now what's interesting about this is this laser also has a prism inside here with the high reflector so you can actually tune the individual wavelengths that come off of this laser. So if we look this way, we can actually see the uh, 528 uh, nanometer line coming out of the laser right now and if I turn this knob, we can actually move it to a different wavelength. So that right there would be the 514 line in uh, in argon and then as we go down we get all the other various wavelengths that are also in here and that can be tuned uh, using the vertical knob to adjust the prism in which lines are coming out of it and there's a nice 488 line this is the uh, peak line in an argon ion laser very nice color beautiful cyan and then here's some other smaller blue lines as we go down the chain. That's in the 450s. And there's a couple other smaller lines at the bottom. And I'll turn this back to a 488 line. It's here somewhere. I think I went too far. Oh, there we go. Can you go too far with lasers? Yeah, can you go too far with lasers? No. <laughs> so, it's making about a watt right now. It's not tuned uh, precisely and this is not full current. But it uh, gives you an idea of what this laser can do. Many argon ion lasers are multi-line, meaning they produce more than one wavelength of light that can be refracted through a prism as seen in the top illustration. This concept is what allows a single line to be selected when a prism is put into the path of the laser beam between the high reflector and the laser tube. The angle of refraction determines which line produces stimulated emission. Here we can see the various output powers of each wavelength of light. Not all of the wavelengths are equally as efficient in argon during lasing. This laser would produce around 6 watts with multi-line optics with all the wavelengths emitted at the same time. This is the wattage of each individual line and what percentage of power they make. This was actually my first time seeing an argon ion laser with a wavelength selector on it. I found it incredibly fascinating, and you will get a good look inside the assembly on the next argon ion laser video that I produce. This has certainly become another thing I look forward to doing more on in the future. I'll also be talking more about the physics involved with ion lasers along with diagrams demonstrating the principles behind how an ion laser makes such an amazing beam and the reason why most dialed lasers don't look as nice as the output from a gas laser. Here we can see how the argon ion laser beam looks over a long distance. 
As the colors are selected, you can see how the beam shape changes as the tuning prism is moved to select different wavelengths. When it's perfectly aligned, it produces a perfect spot. I want to give a special thanks to Adam for help on this project. Learning more about argon ion lasers has been a very enjoyable process for me, and I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a lot about them as well. If lasers are interesting to you, I suggest picking up an ion laser, as they are a lot of fun and have excellent beam characteristics. I'll be doing another video about argon ion lasers in the future, so as always, stay tuned for more.